So today we're going to talk about the Neolithic Revolution. So to begin, we need to we need to understand what the word revolution means. Okay, and revolution means a drastic change. All right, so for the Neolithic Revolution to make any sense, we need to first talk about what it was like before the revolution, so we know what we're changing out of. So before the Neolithic Revolution was a period called the Paleolithic era. Okay, and this paleo means old. So we got old Stone Age over here, and then Neolithic means new. Neo means new, so we got the new Stone Age. Let me go ahead and uh, label my timeline here. Paleolithic could be from uh, 2 million BC all the way up to, let's say, 10,000 BC. Okay, and of course these times aren't exact. Uh, it's not like one day the, the cavemen realized, oh, we're, we're in a new age. This is the Neolithic Revolution. This is something historians and and people have come up with at a later date, and 10,000 BC is just kind of a nice even number, and it happened somewhere around there. So, what exactly happened? In the Paleolithic era, everybody was... Go ahead and create this. People were nomadic. Okay, nomadic means they moved around. Okay, they were hunters. And they were gatherers. That was their primary concern, right? They woke up in the morning. Uh, they didn't have a surplus of food. They didn't have extra food. They had to figure out, okay, where am I going to get my food? I have to go hunt. I have to go gather. I have to find food. So that was the, basically the lifestyle in the Paleolithic era. Okay, 10,000 BC comes along, and something happens. A lot, most people aren't, well, nobody's really sure exactly what happened, but we do know that agriculture... Agriculture developed so people started farming now why they started farming is what I meant when I said nobody knows exactly what happened uh, Did they start farming because? They could no longer hunt enough food to survive or did they just figure out how to farm? Was it the end of the ice age? So now the weather was good for farming that question kind of remains unknown The main thing though in the Neolithic Revolution is the advent of agriculture, right? People started farming all right, and then they also uh, domesticated animals. Domesticated animals. So what does that mean? It means uh, humans can use them. All right, so that could mean an ox uh, pulling a plow. It could mean you're raising cows for milk and for meat. Okay, because we are going from a nomadic lifestyle, we are no longer nomadic. We are no longer hunter-gatherer. We are practicing agriculture. That means we are living in permanent settlements. Okay, humans are living in permanent settlements. So let's talk about settlement patterns really quickly. What do I mean when I say settlement patterns? I mean, where did people settle and why did they settle there? So I'm referring to ancient civilizations, the first civilizations that were started. Okay, we have one here near the Nile in Egypt. We have the Tigris and Euphrates River here in Iraq, the Indus River in India, and then finally the Yellow River in China. So all these ancient civilizations, they developed independently, and they all developed near rivers. So there has to be something to that. There has to be a reason, and there is a reason. Rivers provide a source of water for agriculture. Remember, the Neolithic Revolution is all about farming, all about agriculture, right? That's what the revolution was, so they needed water uh, for the agriculture. So I want to go ahead and uh, review a word we learned earlier in the year. Rivers also created functional regions. All right, and functional regions are regions that work together, right? If you remember that. And they work together because the river serves as a transportation network, right? You can travel up and down the river. You can use the river for irrigation. It can, it can serve as a functional region.
All right, another point I want to make is how the population density changed during the Neolithic Revolution or because of the Neolithic Revolution. Before the Neolithic Revolution, when people were hunter-gatherers, uh, nomadic, they lived off the land, they had to travel, the population density was very small. And all population density means, guys, is how many people live in a given area, so in a certain area. So my green box represents the area, and in the old way, it might have been, oh, two or three dots, right? Not very many people there. You needed a lot of land to support people because you had to hunt animals, you had to survive, right? You couldn't have too many people on the land, otherwise there wouldn't be enough animals to feed them. After the Neolithic Revolution, when agriculture was developed, you had a food surplus. There was plenty of food so people could live on a much smaller area of land, right? So there's going to be a lot more dots. A lot more people can live off this same green box of land, right? What other effects did the Neolithic Revolution cause? And there were a few of them. The first one is specialization. All right, specialization means because they were in permanent settlements, because there was agriculture, uh, because there was a surplus of food, meaning extra food, some people didn't have to spend their whole time gathering food, right? They could actually spend their time doing other things. They could specialize. They could specialize in something or get good at something. So they might uh, get good at making pottery or uh, working with leather, creating leather goods. Okay, socially, how did things change? In the Paleolithic era, people were nomadic. They uh, went from place to place. They lived in smaller groups, maybe 20 or 30. And now you're living in cities, you're living in, in much larger areas, and you're in a permanent place. So social relationships are going to change. A social hierarchy developed. Social hierarchy. Okay, and a hierarchy is usually visualized like this, with uh, some people being at the top of the hierarchy, so the elite, the elite being at the top, and common people being at the bottom. So a social hierarchy started to develop. Many people believe that inequality also increased between men and women. All right, this final slide just lists some questions you need to know the answer to. So how did the Neolithic Revolution change settlement patterns? We talked about that. People lived uh, in permanent locations near rivers. Population density increased. How did the Neolithic Revolution create functional regions? Of course, those those rivers they lived by uh, provided transportation networks, and so those were functional regions. They worked together. And then how did the Neolithic Revolution change social interactions? And it changed social interactions because people lived together. They lived in close proximity. So a social hierarchy started to develop. Uh, inequality between men and women also increased. So these are some questions you need to know the answer to uh, when you think about the Neolithic Revolution and when we end up uh, testing over the Neolithic Revolution. Today I'd like to talk about the Columbian Exchange. So what is the Columbian Exchange? Why is it called the Columbian Exchange? It has nothing to do with Colombians. It has everything to do with Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus discovered the New World in 1492. When I say he discovered the New World, I mean that he discovered it from Europe's perspective. Of course, the Native Americans already knew it was there. The New World, I'm going to go ahead and circle in red. It's everything in the Western Hemisphere. And the Old World, Europe, Asia, Africa, I'm going to go ahead and circle in blue. So the Columbian Exchange was the diffusion of plants, animals, and diseases from the Old World to the New World. And of course, from the New World to the Old World. So first I want to talk about the diffusion or the spread of disease that occurred during the Columbian Exchange. This is pretty nasty. This is smallpox. Okay. And the diffusion or the spread of disease was mostly a one-way exchange, meaning it went one way. It went from the old world to the new world. Okay, there were a few diseases that went from the new world to the old world, but nothing as significant as smallpox, typhoid, and all the diseases that went from the old world to the new world. Okay, there are estimates that say 50% of the native population died. And there's estimates that say 90% of the Native American population died. 
So smallpox was very, very deadly disease for the native population, for the New World population. Let's talk about the diffusion or the spread of crops from the New World to the Old World. So I'm going to go ahead and make a little graph here. And the graph represents what we have native to the New World and Old World. So these were already there before the Columbian Exchange happened. So what was already in the New World? Got potatoes, got tomatoes, uh, corn, pumpkins, and sweet potatoes. What was native to the Old World? You had onions, uh, bananas, and wheat. So this is just a short list. It's more comprehensive than that, of course. But the biggest impact was the potatoes. Okay, the potatoes went from the New World to the Old World. And you could grow a ton of potatoes on a very small area of land, a very small plot of land. Uh, this allowed the, cal the calorie intake in, in the Old World to increase, which meant a population increase. So following the Columbian Exchange, largely to due to the potato, uh, there was a population boom in Europe, particularly Ireland. There weren't even any tomatoes in the Old World before 1492. So Italy, Italy had no tomatoes. That means no lasagna, no spaghetti, no pizza. I'm not sure what Italian food was before the Columbian Exchange, but it wasn't any good. Let's talk about animals. What animals were diffused, exchanged, transferred uh, during the Columbian Exchange? With crops and plants, it was mostly the old world that benefited. However, with animals, it was mostly the new world that benefited. All the new world had prior to the Columbian Exchange, in terms of beasts of burden, was the llama. Okay, and llamas can't hold very much weight. So after the Columbian Exchange, or during the Columbian Exchange, these animals... Uh, were introduced to the Americas. So we had the horse, the cow, and some pigs. Okay, these are all good for various reasons. Horse was uh, vital to Native American culture, right? Indians quickly became expert horsemen. Uh, they became nomadic because of this, many of them, and they started hunting buffalo. Cows, of course, provide milk, and pigs reproduce quickly. So they became a great food source uh, in the Americas. These aren't the only animals that were transferred during, during the Columbian Exchange. Uh, there were also ox. Many beasts of burdens went from the Old World to the New World, which was a great benefit to the New World. So let's talk about the effects of the Columbian Exchange. Let's go ahead and list positive and negative. And this is just real brief. Uh, the positive effect, or one positive effect, is uh, pizza, of course. But more seriously, we had the population boom. In Europe, uh, let's go with a negative effect. A negative effect was the Native American population was decimated by disease. Okay, another positive effect was the introduction of the horse, as well as other animals, to the New World. This was beneficial to the New World for many reasons. Columbian Exchange also led to widespread slavery. All this new land that was going to be colonized, uh, that was very fertile, had a lot of area for agriculture. Agriculture requires hard labor, and so eventually that led to increased slavery. And that is not good. So that is definitely a negative effect of the Columbian Exchange. Today I'd like to talk about the scramble for Africa, which occurred in approximately 1885. But before we do that, we need to talk about significant change that occurred prior to 1885. And first of all, we're going to talk about the Paleolithic era. And this was the era from 2 million BC all the way up until 10,000 BC. And then in 2000 BC, something happened called the Neolithic Revolution. All right, the Neolithic Revolution was the change from hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a agricultural lifestyle where people lived in permanent settlements. The next significant change that occurred was in 1492 and it was called the Columbian Exchange. This was when the New World met the Old World or the Old World met the New World and disease animals and plants changed from the Old World to the New World or diffused. Alright, in 1780 the Industrial Revolution occurred or began. We haven't talked about that yet. We will get to that in the next lesson. But right now we're going to talk about 1885, what occurred in 1885, uh, Common Era, 
And that was the scramble for Africa. All right, that was when European countries started to colonize and imperialize the countries of Africa. So that's what we are going to talk about today. All right, let's talk about the vocabulary you're going to need to know when you talk about the scramble for Africa. And the first two words you're going to need to know are colonialism and imperialism. And they're essentially the same. And they basically say that a country exerts control or influence over a foreign country or territory. The next word you're going to need to know is mercantilism. Mercantilism is an economic theory that states that a country must import from foreign territories. Alright, exploitation. The last word is exploitation. Exploitation is selfish use of resources. Alright, so you don't care about what happens to the country that you're using the resources from. All you care about is what happens for you. You're exploiting them. Alright, here is a political cartoon of the mad scramble for Africa. So what is the mad scramble for Africa? All it is is European countries vying or fighting for control of African territory. So why would European countries want to have control of African territories or resources? Well the simple answer is money. And in this case money meant natural resources. So Africa had natural resources that Europe wanted for the Industrial Revolution. You gotta remember, and we haven't talked about this yet, so of course you can't remember, but Europe was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Because Europe was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, they were in need of natural resources. So they all wanted natural resources. So in 1885, they set up the Berlin Conference. And the Berlin Conference was a meeting where European countries met and they decided to split up African territories amongst themselves. And of course, the only people not present at this meeting were African countries. So that doesn't make any sense at all, but that's how it went down. European countries split up Africa without any input at all from African countries. And this was all again for their natural resources. They wanted to exploit their natural resources and they wanted to import them back to the European countries. All part of their economic system of mercantilism again. Alright, so let's talk about the effects of decolonization. So what is decolonization? That is when the colonizing powers of Europe, the imperialistic powers of Europe, left. Alright, and this happened after World War II to make a long story short. And we need to know what the impact, what effect it had. And the impact was largely negative. It was not good. Why wasn't it good? Basically because Europe did not care. Europe left carelessly. The new boundaries or borders were based on old colonial boundaries. Well, what was the problem with this? Europe left, they left the boundaries the same, so what was the problem? Well, the problem was these boundaries often included two or more ethnic groups that were opposed to each other. And of course, this led to conflict. Lots of conflict. All right, so today I want to very briefly discuss the Industrial Revolution. We've already seen the word revolution in this unit before. Let's go ahead and discuss it again, though, real quick. Revolution, again, means a drastic change. So earlier we talked about the Neolithic Revolution. The Industrial Revolution began in about 1750. Some, some sources say 1780, but it was in, in the mid-1700s, in this, in this range. And the Industrial Revolution began in Europe, in England specifically. What was the revolution? What was the change? And the change was moving from a system in which goods were made uh, in what we called the cottage system. And that's when goods were made 
in people's houses or homes. And this was very small scale, right? You weren't making a million shirts in your house. This was small scale. So we transitioned from that, and what, what did we change into? Uh, most of us know the answer to that. We changed to the factory system. Okay, and the factory system is one in which goods are mass-produced. This is large scale. All right, now I want to talk about why did the Industrial Revolution begin in Great Britain? And there are a lot of reasons it began in Great Britain, and we're just going to go over a few of them, as well as just why did the Industrial Revolution begin in the first place. So one reason was improved farming techniques. And these improved farming techniques led to an increase in population. So an increase in population. Well, with that increase in population, we had the labor force that was going to be required for the Industrial Revolution. We had workers ready to go to work in factories, so the labor force was ready. Another reason the Industrial Revolution began, specifically in Great Britain, is Great Britain had an abundance, that means they had plenty of, natural resources. Okay, and as we learned earlier in the scramble for Africa, the natural resources that they didn't have, uh, they had the power and the ability to go get those natural resources. All right, and one more reason the Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain was because they had the capital, meaning they had the money. Okay, there were very wealthy people in Great Britain uh, that could invest in railroads and factories and mines, coal mines, everything that was required for the Industrial Revolution to begin. All right, so what were the effects of the Industrial Revolution? We're going to talk about both positive and negative effects of the revolution. Uh, one of the positive effects of the Industrial Revolution, of course, was new technology. Right? There were a lot of innovative, there were a lot of new inventions that were changing the world. Most of them were invented in either America or England. All right, we also had the emergence of the working class. The working class were the people that were going to work in the factories. And they didn't get paid very well, so I'm going to go ahead and put that as a negative, although in the end it perhaps was a positive. Okay, another positive is we're not using the cottage system anymore. Now we're in the factory system, so goods are being mass produced. So mass production, that means a lot of goods are being produced very quickly, and that leads to lower prices, right? So stuff costs less now, and that's a good thing. All right, another negative was the fact that the working conditions in the factories were not very good. There were bad working conditions. All right, and that included long hours. This is before the time of labor unions, so they would often work 15, 16-hour days. It was none of this eight-hour day stuff that we have these days. Child labor was not uncommon. Children would often work in the factories. The working conditions were quite unsafe. This was not regulated at first, so the factories were very unsafe. All right, and then a very important word I'm going to put down here at the bottom is urbanization. And urbanization is the idea that people are moving from rural to the cities. So we're urbanizing. Our cities are getting very, very big. All right, so my happy people here are moving to the cities. Along with urbanization, the idea that people were moving to cities, and this was happening very rapidly, meaning people were moving to the cities very quickly. Very quickly, these cities were getting big. And so there wasn't much time to plan for the arrival of all these new people in the cities. So that led to very crowded conditions. Uh, often the cities were very polluted. The pollution got really bad. Right? There was trash in the streets. And there were poor living conditions. Many of the people lived in tenements that were not very nice. Poor living conditions. The last one, and we've already talked about this when we went over the scramble for Africa, was... European imperialism and their exploitation of others for natural resources.